tutti seduti se no. Buongiorno. Siamo qui per questo primo incontro del ciclo del Good evening. We are here for the first meeting of a series of meetings promoted by Professor Violante and the title is Being Italians. This is a topic which is particularly interesting at the time, at this time, because uh, this is the story of our country, a country where for centuries, uh, in the last 2,000 years, I'd say, has always been a country rich in talent, that spread history, innovation, art, and culture all over the world. But a country that actually achieved its uh, national unity very late. So we have these very strange characteristics. Being Italian has always meant something important. But 500 years ago, being Italian didn't mean having a national identity. We had uh, some national characteristics, but we didn't have a state. And this went on for quite a long time, because only in 1861 did Italy become a unified country. But we had uh, some problems in living this unity. There were always uh, divisions, gaps, and in spite of uh, our uh, presence in the world, 26 million immigrants, Italian immigrants in the whole world, we never really became Italians. So let's say that uh, there were ups and downs in uh, after the war being Italians meant to make a common effort in spite of internal divisions after the first world war we managed to be one of the most industrialized countries in the world we, we had a strong currency with the Italian lira in, uh, at the beginning of the 60s. And this uh, Italian unity seemed to be very strong. But the history of our republic is characterized by many divisions and difficulties. Now we are living in a, a, an era of nationalisms. Japan, the United States, Pakistan, Russia, Pol Poland, Austria are all experiencing a, a trend towards the idea of a nation that was typical of the 19th century. And this theme of being Italian is experiencing a crisis because we are wondering what does it mean to be Italian? We carry with ourselves the, uh, let's say, geographical, territorial divisions that we were not able to overcome in the centuries, and we are still experiencing an ideological, cultural division which is bigger now than it used to be in the past. One of uh, the characteristics of our being Italians has been for a long time, from the beginning of the Second Republic, the, that of being people that had a relationship with the, the state, as in many other countries, but there were so many other movements, associations, cultural realities that uh, created groups. But this is now experiencing a crisis, and this has a double effect. We are now living in very close realities that look at the outside world with suspicion. And these groups cannot build a national identity and thus leave room for 
individualism. So, President Violante thought that uh, we had to simply ask ourselves what does it mean to be Italians in a moment when being Italian doesn't have a meaning even in the in terms of uh, World Football Cup. So, what does it mean today to be Italian? On the Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera, Polito wrote, we have stopped believing in progress. Others have said the Italians have stopped believing in participation, which used to be a very important element in our history. We are always complaining. Being Italian today seems to be something negative in a way. And this is very different from uh, that uh, idea of a positive anthropology, as De Vico said or wrote on the Corriere della Sera, that has a, a constructive, a, a positive characteristic that has something to do with happiness. So, well, this meeting tonight is based on a very uh, sensitive uh, topic. This series of meetings is a very actually interesting uh, uh, question mark, so to speak. What makes us Italians as people, as conscience, as groups, as well as uh, scientific, social, political, and cultural reality? So, well, uh, the two speakers that uh, are here to open this uh, uh, series of meetings are uh, particularly uh, suitable for uh, this topic because of uh, their uh, background and uh, their experience uh, that uh, will help us in finding a question, in finding an answer to this question. So we have here with us Luciano Violante, a professor of constitutional right, president of uh, the Chamber of Deputy, and uh, 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 the president of uh, the anti mafia Commission and the president of the Foundation Italia de Cide. And uh, he is the one who has organized this uh, cycle of uh, conferences, of uh, meetings. And then we have Diego Piacentini, who is one of the well, greatest managers in the world. He worked for Amazon for 16 years as vice, international vice president, and now he works pro bono as extraordinary commissary for the um, digital agenda of the Italian government. So this is a very important factor of the Italian effort to keep up with the times. So well, I would like to welcome him with a round of applause. And he's a great friend of the meeting. He's already been here in Rimini many times. So I will now leave the floor to Luciano Violante, who will explain why he decided to propose this cycle of uh, uh, events, of conferences, uh, what is his purpose, and what he thinks about being Italian. But I think there is maybe a video. Yes, I would just like to in, for you to introduce this video. Yes, we have uh, interviewed 21 persons, uh, and we asked them, what do you think, or what does it mean for you to be Italian? And the video we are going to show now is a summary of about seven, eight minutes. You can find the um, complete version of about 25 min min minutes on the uh, web page of the meetings. The relationship between Italians and their history is not based on identity. The beautiful thing about Italy is that it has to be uh, inclusive. Uh, everyone has to be able to become Italian. It is still possible to have uh, uh, an, Ital an Italian uh, identity that is solid. If Italy doesn't want to, uh, to uh, be, uh, so to speak, at, at the top, uh, and uh, well, then it can be itself. Italy is the country of the of 
100 cities. Italians love their cities and their histories, which they feel as part of their own identity. So while uh, it's uh, less strong, the history with the uh, Unitarian history of Italy, we have never been, uh, not even in our uh, a splendid uh, period, a, a real uh, state. Uh, we had uh, um, historical periods with great divisions, the municipalities. If I think about identities, but my own identities, I think it is made up of different threads. I'm Italian, of course, but I'm also European, and uh, this is also undoubted, but I'm Mediterranean. So, well, uh, Swedish, Arabian, uh, French, uh, there is no clash uh, among these different identities because an identity is like a river and we belong to different worlds. From this point of view, Italy is a, a plural country. The uh, history of Italy is a very, very rich heritage, richer than that of other countries. So, well, this is a big heritage for us. The idea, the idea of a confederate Italy, which is not a state in itself, made of different municipalities, which was then um, held together by uh, the glue of uh, the Catholic religion, and not so much uh, the uh, unified Italy that uh, was uh, based on this pretense to impose uh, with violence uh, the unity in a way that was went against uh, the Catholic uh, religion. So this is, uh, in a way, our way of being, trying to circumvent uh, the rules, because we've always been dominated by foreign powers because Italy was made by just a few um, in front of the indifference of the most. So, well, uh, we still uh, have to do what Dazzaglio used to say, Italy was made, now we have to make it the Italians. But this is a very ambitious goal. Uh, the uh, our uh, homeland is the place where you realize whether your life is a uh, is real or uh, if your life has its own uh, promise that you wanted to make true and uh, well there is also a value in our countries because we have been able to overcome so many difficulties and this strength has been passed on to us by our parents grandparents those who came before us and built our country uh, well if we wanted to say that uh, being italian means well you know pasta pizza and so on well this is laughable uh, Ital the Italians are competent people, generous people. Uh, this is a people that is not aggressive. Uh, um, we are people that uh, have uh, a very deep sense of humanity. It, the Italians are a work, culture, sense of, the, of a family, which is not uh, something closed, but it's something that open up, opens up to love. In Italy, or rather, I think that we really have a, a QI which is higher than that of the rest of the world. I love Italy, and I'm really proud, together with my uh, partners uh, of the third generation, to have uh, built up in the south of Italy an industry pasta industry that has created 500 jobs. Everything that is made in Italy or even just designed in Italy is cool. For instance, wine and food products, uh, a growth also in terms of fashion uh, Italian fashion is, is cool, everything that has to do with automotive. And also in the field of uh, uh, electronic, mu electronic music, uh, we have uh, Italians among the top 50s in the world. My idea, together with uh, my partners, is to focus on, on uh, quality, on uh, the uh, 
skills of Italy. On uh, Italy's uh, capability to produce uh, original things, good things, uh, um, things that are really of a very high level. My way of thinking is more Italian than Chinese. I. I say exactly what I think, and this is an Italian characteristic. I feel I'm Italian because I wear my uniform every day, and this gives me a sense of belonging to the state. Uh, well, I think that to define oneself Italian is a source of proud, but also in a way some kind of constraint, of limitation. And I'm in line with the, so many other people who have different nationalities. And unfortunately, being Italian only depends on uh, an, uh, an identity document. Being Italian means being aware of the great history of our country. I studied in Florence, uh, studied uh, the period of the Renaissance, art, economy, politics, and the things that I have learned at the time are still valid in particular um, for Italian entrepreneurs. The creativity, the flexibility of Italian entrepreneurs is still very important. Italy is an extraordinary place, a country with beautiful places, places, poetic places. And uh, well, the heart earthquakes in central Italy as um, so that uh, uh, many people have run to help those uh, immigrants who came to Italy by boat from the sea. So if I think about this uh, solidarity aspect of Italy, I, say, I can say I'm proud of being Italian. The history of Italy was the history of a peninsula that participated in many historical events, not in a hegemonic way, but in an open way. The history of Italy is a his the history of a country that has been uh, influenced by France, by Spain, by the Arabic world. And there is a debate today, uh, the uh, Italianists, uh, sovereignists, and uh, there is uh, a rough way to be Italians, Italians first, for instance. In my school, I have a lot of uh, uh, children that uh, come from other countries, and being Italian means to welcome them in a certain way so that they feel part of the community. I think that the perspective for our, uh, for us, university students is to go abroad, to leave Italy. Well, here in Italy, I cannot be myself. I can be Ital an Italian only if I live outside of Italy. I am teaching our history abroad, so I'm not rejecting my own, my own roots. We have to go beyond our Italian borders to understand how beautiful our country is. We are living on the border here we are uh, 10 kilometers from Switzerland, 40 kilometers from France, and the border changes its significance, its meaning in time, and we live it this in a different way today. It's something that keeps changing, so there's nothing that uh, is, uh, um, it's always changing and always uh, developing. Australians say that they understand I'm Italian from the way I move my hands when I speak, but they also recognize the passion I put in my work. And uh, well, maybe also in the future as a uh, Chinese uh, living in Italy, well, Italy is becoming more and more uh, multi-ethnical. So well, the, the relationship to different cultures, different traditions, different peoples, this is a great richness that marks the uh, historical uh, heritage of Italy. <clears throat> Well, you saw how many ways exist to be Italians, so each one has its own way. In 1983, at the Sanremo Song Festival, a musician sort of took part in the contest. His name is uh, Toto Cutugno, and the song was entitled L'Italiano, the Italian. Come 
Italia che non si spaventa Con la crema da barba la menta Con un vestito gessato sul blu E la moviola la domenica in tv Buongiorno Italia col caffè ristretto Le calze nuove nel primo cassetto Con la bandiera in tintoria e una 600 giù di carrozzeria Italia, buongiorno Maria, con gli occhi pieni di malinconia, buongiorno Dio, lo sai che ci sono anch'io, lasciatemi cantare con la chitarra in mano, lasciatemi And almost at the same time, Giorgio Gaber used to sing another song in the same period. Io, Gigi, sono nato e vivo a Milano. Io non mi sento italiano. Ma per fortuna o purtroppo. I do not feel Italian, but fortunately or unfortunately, I am Italian. Mi scusi, Presidente. Sorry, Mr. President, it's not my fault. But I don't know what uh, this country is about. Maybe it's my mistake. Well, it could be a good idea, but it may turn into a bad piece of poetry. I'm sorry, Mr. President, but I feel a bit ashamed about our national anthem. Well, I don't want to judge our football players, if you do not know it. I do not feel Italian, but fortunately or unfortunately, I am Italian. Excuse me, Mr. President, and please forgive me if I say that I do not feel any belonging apart from uh, Garibaldi and other glorious heroes. I don't see many reasons to be proud. I'm sorry, Mr. President, uh, but I think about the fanatism of black shirts when fascism ruled the country. and But then one day democracy was born and uh, you need a lot of imagination to be to congratulate it. I do not feel Italian, but fortunately or unfortunately, I am Italian. And then the song ends with the last sentence that says, fortunately, I am Italian. So I do not feel Italian. I think that this is a sentence that we heard so many times in our life. And, uh, well, this is something that has to do about a sort of rejection of belonging, but that somehow acknowledges it, because <laughs> identity doesn't need to be discovered, because it's not something hidden to be found. Well, identity needs to be reconstructed, and you need to pay the way for that in order to create a, a sort of a unique identity. And so you need uh, key elements like culture, cities, history, legacy. So we need to sort of uh, go back to basics to see the building blocks of our identity. And in particular, Italy went through 2,000 years of history and uh, at times, uh, it was one of the key players on, on the scenario of history, but sometimes it didn't. But still, thinking over our identity means trying to go back to our 
millennial stories and try to understand what is the essence of our uh, being Italian, trying to integrate it and update it and try to sort of uh, spot and pinpoint the key elements of being Italian. There are several circumstances to be considered relating to politics and history. Why should we insist on the notion of identity? Because sometimes you go through regression times when a country seemed to have lost its sense of identity when it happened at the end of the Second World War. Sometimes there are times of fanatism, uh, for instance, uh, during the fascism with the, the tragic uh, reality of uh, Russia laws, or sometimes there are identities that are proposed that do not match the history and legacy of Italy, but um, match a specific political project, and that seems to be the case of today and the current political reality. So all these situations occurred at some point in our history. Nobody ever doubted about the fact that Michelangelo, Leonardo, Dante, Petrarca were Italians. In 1454, a very important historian of that time, Flavio Biondo, devoted to Francesco Votaghe, uh, Francesco Votaghe, uh, ruler of Venice, a text on Venetians. And he said in the introductory note, uh, he used to say, <laughs> I read it in time, not in Latin, I am uh, from Italy. I am Italic, so to speak. But if I uh, have some value, I owe it to, to Italy and uh, the Christian world. So in 1454, a person from Veneto region already talked about uh, this notion. And uh, again, in Bohemia, Italian designers and architects were invited to the court. And then two centuries after, Peter the Great, uh, the Tsar of Russia, invited Italian architects to their court to turn sort of um, wetland uh, and uh, turn it into the noble uh, St. Petersburg. So what uh, made us stood out in the past? And uh, actually, there was no Italian state, so there was no sense of belonging. But there was a belonging to a specific cultural model that did not exist in other countries. And that cultural model was uh, relying on uh, creativity, on art. <laughs> on works of art and masterpieces and <coughs> masters and that were able also to pass on their knowledge. So these masters were not flattered down in one single sort of uh, template. Not at all. Each one was specific and peculiar. So, I mean, uh, Italians have been existing before the Italian state uh, existed. So, let's think about a uh, sentence uttered by D'Azeglio. So, D'Azeglio said, well, Italy has been made, now we need to make Italians. But actually, Italians have already existed. I mean, uh, it was needed to create Italy. So, the pillars of Italian identity are, in my opinion, three. Uh, multiplicity a lot of creativity and uh, culture, tolerance, and then the language, and then Catholicism. A key element in our history is the lack of a central political power likely to reunite the country, as it happened around 1500 in France, in Spain, and in Great Britain. Political Italy, so lagged behind of about three centuries compared uh, with other uh, European countries. We had uh, a very fragmented state, no central political power, but uh, a sort of entity made of microstates. And then we had republics and counties and so on. No uh, reality, no entity was big enough to have a lot of power, as it was the case, uh, on the contrary, in Germany. So the lack of such a, a unifying uh, political center of power had major repercussions. No national vision of the future of the country, localism, and uh, a tendency to sort of uh, self uh, this sort of self-criticizing, and then uh, sort of the tendency also to 
rapidly and quickly and repeatedly change one's own political views. So we, are, we have plenty of defects, but we also have some virtues. And uh, ironically, these virtues are the positive repercussions of this delay in the creation of Italian states. We are so much aware of our defects, so I would like to sort of underscore our uh, virtues. And also, it's never good to, to think about what is wrong, because if we all say everything is wrong, well, we can't progress. I mean, we risk to be in a stalemate. So. Only by relying on virtues you can sort of overcome the defects. And uh, the lack of these uh, central political power somehow uh, sort of uh, favored the, the thriving of uh, these Italian multiplicity because there was no imposition, because every little state uh, tried to compete in a positive way, improving its performances at all levels, in all sectors, in art, for instance, in literature, in music, so in order to be better than the others. And that brought about uh, uh, material and tangible richness, but also cultural intangible richness. Our creativity, imagination, and cultural elegance, gastronomy, cuisine, so to result from this absence of a, a central political power, as it was the case uh, on the opposite in France, where there was such a political central power. So the absence of such a power and sometimes uh, the interference of some uh, foreign uh, rulers and kings uh, sort of brought about several kinds of consequences. Well, however, we got used to diversity, to welcoming, to opening up. We have become flexible on a daily basis. We have become used to finding solutions instead of complaining of problems. We didn't have uh, the uh, religious wars. We didn't, did not have massacres. Uh, the religion wars for 30 years uh, made Europe in large regions like uh, uh, bloodshed. Uh, uh, we sort of uh, have to think about the Italian homogeneousness. And certainly language played a key role. Spanish schools still today teach four different mother tongues, uh, Galician, Basque, Castilian, and Catalan. And uh, the Madrid government has to accept that. In uh, Belgium, we have uh, Flemish and, Fran and French uh, that compete with each other. In the UK, we have Gaelic and Scottish together with English. So if we go back in time, uh, in the same period when Dante used to write in vernacular Italian his comedy, on the other side of the country, Jacopo Valentini at the court of Frederick II wrote in the same language uh, as Dante. During the Risorgimento, there was a debate about a common language. Uh, many sort of people sort of were involved, and uh, everybody agreed upon Florentine, and even Alessandro Manzoni decided also to uh, rewrite uh, his novel, uh, uh, I Promise His Posi, The Promised, um, the promised Wets, to, uh, well, I mean, with the Florentine uh, vernacular language. And then, so little by little, the Italian language was born, and the Catholic Church uh, has played a key role in defining the Italian identity. We need uh, to go back to the Christianity of the origins when Paul, that was a Roman citizen, decided to sort of, uh, sort of go to the heart of the Roman Empire, and uh, actually that universalism ambition was also adopted by the Catholic Church. We have uh, the U.S. that have Protestants and uh, Catholics. The U.K. has Presbyterians, Catholics, Methodists. Uh, and the Catholic faith does not divide Italy. On the contrary, it has contributed to building up the Italian identity. And now, to conclude, I would like to tell you more about the reasons why we should delve much more into the matter of the Italian identity. So 73 years have passed since the end of the Second World War. 
and uh, the liberal democratic vision has been dominating so far. Let's think about also the project of the European Union. We have a, a sort of a dominating multicultural sort of model. But since the beginning of this new century, this vision has been opposed by a new vision based on new nationalism forms. It is called sovereignism. As Giorgio Vitadini said, India, Pakistan, Turkey, Slovenia, Hungary, Czech Republic, US, and Italy, and so on, so many countries are characterized by this tendency. In many of these countries, including Italy, attacks to those who are considered as uh, other uh, have increased. So, black uh, gypsies, uh, homosexuals, this is a very worrying tendency. It's a worrying way to consider identity. So insulting, attacking, baiting, killing a person because a person is black, is homosexual, is Egyptian, is something that seems to be as a strengthening element of identity, something that then leads to exclusion, leads to setting borders and uh, making up wars. I don't know if you remember that we had uh, a minister, uh, Ms. Kenja, in the part of the government, and uh, she was attacked uh, by some people who uh, threw some bananas at her. And these people said, we are not racist. We are uh, identity supporters. So, uh, identity definition was based on this act of attacking. But actually, this is not something that belongs to us, not at all. This violent and nationalist identity is not part of our culture, is not part of our history, of our legacy. But if there is no clear opposition, if no other identity is opposed to that, no other way to be Italian, it's inevitable that this is going to sort of be more and more common. And so we may end up in some form of planned discrimination and then to a form of a sort of collective thinking. The urban model is around the corner. In 1923, a great Italian uh, journalist, De Benedetti, interviewed uh, Hitler for the Gazzetta del Popolo newspaper from Turin, and Hitler uh, sort of uh, answered and talked about uh, his program, the destruction of an international vision. So, attracting uh, blue-collar workers to our political movement. Uh, we want to have uh, honest and capable people uh, ruling the country. I am a dictator. I want to be dominated by the so-called parliament or the so-called uh, people's representatives. Uh, the Benedetti ended the interview saying, I don't think that is so dangerous. Probably he largely underestimated uh, this person. So we need to uh, defend and protect our identity, an identity that uh, is not about creating enemies to get consensus, but we should promote an identity based on our cultural and uh, sort of civic story. Our culture, our identity is based on the respect, a knowledge of the other, on the beauty, on creativity, imagination, the mastering of uh, know-how. These are the key features that allow people like Diego Pecentini to be leaders in highly competitive sectors. And some people may ask themselves, why is it so that they are successful out of Italy? Because Italians are there, but maybe we haven't completed the Italy creation process yet. Thank you. Allora, Diego Piacentini. So, well, uh, I will ask Diego Piacentini to add to what uh, Luciano Violante said, starting from his professional experience, which is a, well, a world experience. What is the link between his talent and his Italian identity? Um, studying and working in Italy or abroad, and what are the characteristics, the, the skills that uh, Italians have in the world. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for your very kind introductory words. I'm very happy. I cannot uh, stay seated all the time because I move my hands a lot when I talk. Well, this is the second time I'm here in uh, uh, 
uh, Rimini. I came to the meeting in 1998 for the first time 20 years ago then. And I, was, I came here with a very dear friend who's here sitting in the for first row, Mario Guaraldi, and it was, it was him who asked me to come back after 20 years. Well, in 1998, I had just been appointed Okay. I had just been uh, appointed as head of uh, Apple Europe and had just moved to Paris, well, not too far from, uh, from Italy, from Milan. After two years, after 13 years uh, working for Apple, I moved together uh, with my uh, family to this uh, small uh, company that used to sell books online, which was called Amazon. So we moved from Milan, uh, first to Parigi, and then uh, to Paris, sorry, and then to Seattle. So this was, uh, well, my, my uh, story. And uh, I was uh, talking uh, with the professor Violante before uh, the beginning of uh, the um, event. Uh, I, uh, when there is an, something that is excellent, it doesn't matter whether it, you are Italian or Japanese or uh, French. Uh, there is a great component that is that of what happens in your life. When I arrived in, uh, uh, I started working to, for Amazon, nobody asked me, where are you from? What is your nationality? Even though maybe my accent helped them understand where I came from. So in many different situations, being a French, being Italian, uh, or being European, the Americans uh, often say, you Europeans, uh, they have difficulties in making a difference between uh, the different uh, it, uh, European countries. They, they see, well, the Great Britain on the one side and then the rest of Europe on the other, on the other side. So that's, that's how they see it. So this was, uh, in a way, uh, my story in, in Amazon. I started as uh, responsible for international activities. And when I arrived there, actually, there were no international activities. So I was lucky enough to uh, be able to meet, to have contacts in, with many different cultures in Europe, in Brazil, in Europe, in China, in the Far East, in the Middle East. So, well, I, I could in see how the different cultures interacted with the technological innovation. But as I was saying before, and I, I'd say this is what actually makes the world develop. If the all different excellencies, so to speak, uh, those that are at uh, the top in terms of uh, human sciences, as well as the arts, as well as technologies. All these people, it doesn't matter if they are Italian or European or whatever. And they are the, the engine of uh, the development of our world. So while I was lucky enough, and I say it and I repeat it, I was lucky because many young people ask them, how can I have the same career that you had? Well, obviously, you need to have certain characteristics, but but luck has really a very important role to play. You need to be in the right place at the right moment. Yes, of course, you have to be able to grab your opportunities, but uh, one of the questions I was asked at my job interview was, do you think you are uh, luckier or uh, um, that you are uh, uh, more skilled? And if uh, they, uh, the uh, candidate answered, I think I have great skilled, skills, uh, well, often they were not given the job. So, uh, well, you need to, to, to uh, think in these terms. And then I would like to, to stand up. Tra l'altro mi fa sorridere parlare di give back che in italiano si So well uh, we talk about to give back and it is in a way um, it makes me smile to talk about giving back here where we have so many volunteers it's well something that you know what what it is and I know that you will understand what I'm going to say 
this is uh, my son's kindergarten. My wife used to be um, to work as a volunteer. I would, well, my son is up on the uh, left side with the red T-shirt. This is uh, about 1998, 1999. So my wife was the chairwoman of uh, uh, the uh, committee to raise funds to buy all these uh, 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 um, toys and games, and they managed to uh, to collect 1,200,000 lire at the time. Here we are in the United States, a couple of years after the, the first picture. Here is the other, uh, my second son, uh, the one with the Gap uh, hoodie. And uh, well, uh, we participated in the school auction. Obviously, it was uh, uh, something that was uh, well, a very important event for the school because uh, uh, this uh, is a very important uh, phase in the um, development of a kid. So in one evening, they collected about $200,000. So there's a, quite a great difference. I don't even want to, to to say that there is a difference between the small, uh, the small uh, uh, suburban area in Italy and Seattle. But anyway, this fundraising was uh, an exceptional event, and there was this effort on the part of a few people, whereas here in the United States, that was really part of the whole structure. It was, well, it's really n normal in the Anglo-Saxon world that you, you work, you have a good career, you uh, give back what you actually had. So you have museums, you have schools, so you, you develop or you help developing cultural activities. So we move from a situation where this give back uh, is a situation based on the will of individuals to a situation where it is part of the structure. Probably there are also some negative effects and repercussions. But anyway, there's this very big difference between the two systems. What is this? Don't get worried. We are in 2008. Obama had just been elected president of the United States. The system of what was called the Obamacare, the healthcare system, after spending this uh, uh, $100 million dollars to create this system, the system crashed completely the very first day. So what happened? This was actually uh, the, the uh, insurance system. It was a very uh, drastic, dramatic reform in terms of uh, health care with the great technological efforts. And on the very first day, it crashes. So what happened in Italy? There would have been, uh, obviously, a lot of complaints, two or three big conferences and meetings, a couple of lows uh, and decrease. And after three years, nothing would have changed, probably. What happened to the United States? Well, someone said, we have to do something. People from Google, Oracle, they said, OK, the White House has sent out a call for help. And these people left their own companies for six months, one year. And in a few weeks, all these skills, because obviously the government lacked the necessary skill to do this kind of system, and they helped to build up this website, which was already operational after a couple of weeks. So what did they do? What did, uh, what did these people do? We do not uh, need to think about giving back only in terms of uh, helping the poor or uh, helping the schools. Here, these people contributed with their own expertise, with their own know-how, their skills to change the user interface, to make it more user-friendly. And all this led to an innovation that is really incredible. People 
left their own uh, desks to go and help their government to do something that would have been useful for the whole country. Let's move forward a couple of more years, 2016, and uh, where I had already spent 16 years in Amaton. The uh, Italian Prime Minister at the time, Matteo Renzi, quite a long time ago in political terms, about three governments ago, even it's just two years ago, uh, came to Cupertino and uh, it told me, I have this idea to have a digital transformation of public administration in Italy. Would you like to come back to Italy? And uh, my first answer was, you're kidding me, right? But then we went more into details. We had ex many exchange of views. And I was starting to realize that in the back of my mind, as well as in my heart, the idea of coming back to my country and help my country, giving back what I had learned, was actually becoming uh, something feasible. So what I said was, let's try it. This is Yoda from Star Wars. I think all of you know him. Well. This was my inspiration in a way. I had very important models from which I could try, I could draw inspiration. And I, I think I, it was my turn to become a model in a way for some, someone else. So I came back to Italy. I accepted a position as extraordinary commissioner for the digitalization of public administration. So I moved from Seattle back to Rome, or back to Italy in Rome. What made me take this decision? Well, I thought, everyone is telling me that this is going to fail. It's going to be a failure, because in Italy nothing works. But I told myself, it is better to try and fail, that then not to try it, not to try at all. So this is idea that has always accompanied me. If I say no, I will still be regretting it in two, three, four years. So that's why I took this decision, and I made my choice. A very important choice. Moving with my moving to Rome, but my family remained in Seattle to attempt this mission to to digitalize the Italian public administration, moving from analogical uh, uh, um, bureaucracy to digitalization. Why are you doing this? You leave Amazon uh, uh, pro bono with. Uh, because this is what, what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be paid for what I was doing because I really wanted to help my country. So these were the things that people told me. These were uh, things that uh, were not actually said by my enemies, but by my parents. When I told my parents, look, I decided to, to leave Amazon for a certain period of time well, I had decided to leave Amazon, but uh, they uh, asked me to take uh, a two years leave and then to, to decide what I wanted to do, which is a very wise approach. Anyway, from the point of view of my parents, that was a mistake. So I said, if the people who love me most are suspicious in, in what I'm doing because I am going to deal with public administration, they asked them, what, what are you going to get in return? That's what I asked them. So if my, if my parents were saying this, what I thought, what will the political ad, uh, enemies of uh, Matteo Renzi say? This is uh, uh, Detective Megre, for those who don't know him, don't know him. He's a French detective. And why? Why do I have this picture? Because there was also a, um, a legal aspect. Because 
I said I want to take on board skilled people. You need to have people who have technological skills. Otherwise, we cannot go anywhere. So we need to have or uh, to hire people from the outside. So the only way to do this was for me to be appointed extraordinary commissioner. commissioner. So I thought, since we cannot change the system from the inside, I have to create my own team, a team of people that can come with me, that can actually uh, um, identify themselves in my mission, that want to give, give something back to their own country. So my first uh, communication, so to speak, was that I uh, published a job description for people who could identify themselves uh, with my mission. Dear talents who live, who live in, who live in Italy or want to go back uh, also temporarily uh, with uh, uh, um, um, a pay that will probably be much less than what you're earning at the moment, how can I convince you to do this? So, um, well, this is an image of an old uh, advertisement. So the vision was uh, the change of the operational system of the country to build up uh, the very, uh, very simple services of the public uh, administration. It is a huge task. Uh, we are just starting it because if we really want to, we really want to simplify the whole of the Italian uh, administration, we, that will take 10 years. We will find a lot of uh, laws and rules that will be very difficult to understand. We will have to manage uh, the local bureaucracy. More, many people will tell us you do not understand how the Italian administration works. That's how it works in Italy. So many others tried. There is a, because I had seen the skeptical approach on the part of my parents, and I applied it to those who might uh, decide to accept my offer. I said, we will be highly criticized. There will be some uh, useful criticisms, but uh, there will also be uh, some uh, uh, cynical uh, criticism. The first kind of, uh, criti uh, of criticism will be uh, those of people who really would like to give their uh, contribution. The second type of criticism will come from those who have re really given up. Uh, to uh, our uh, situation in Italy, uh, those who see the empty, the half-empty glass all the time. So this is the cover of Time. This is the team that we created uh, in January 2017. I had uh, 3,000 applications of people who want to become part of this team. I knew just one person of all the whole this team. I started in, with uh, a few tests, uh, mathematics, uh, coding, and so on. Uh, we have also uh, um, a legal expert who is a really uh, very, extremely expert in terms of uh, uh, the legal aspects connected with the, in the uh, net, the internet. And we are working on different activities uh, that go beyond the creation of plans. We are really doing operational activities. Uh, we are uh, like plumbers, uh, the plumbers of digitalization, as I tried to, to explain to my mother. Because in order to digitalize a public administration, there is a lot that have to be done that will not be seen. A, a beautiful house has a hydraulic uh, a, a plant that no one sees, but it has to work. Otherwise, the whole house wouldn't work. So this is what we are actually working at at the moment. We wanted to improve certain services. May 2017, we published the, the uh, three-year plan for the transformation, for the digital transformation of the public administration. It's a very ambitious plan. And uh, well, if you're interested in technologies, please go, please go and have a look. This was assigned by Paolo Gentiloni. I had already lost my political sponsor at the time. So uh, we started to work on different digital products from uh, digitalized payments, the creation of uh, a, a single uh, um, 
sulla carta su alcuni aspetti della carta d'identità elettronica, sull'identità digitale. A single register office perché in Italia ci sono 800 municipalità e ogni ha il suo register office. So, well. Uh, these are all the uh, basic services that are uh, needed to have uh, all the other services uh, that are uh, um, used by citizens. We have created new ways uh, to, to uh, cooperate and to communicate because our way of communicating is very different from uh, the uh, bureaucratic uh, path that is followed in Italy. Uh, because we uh, use uh, uh, different, uh, let's say, more friendly ways to talk to local administrations, for instance. And when now, uh, well, to move on to the services, we have to dream a little bit. Digitalization is not only based on technology. Digitalization means a transformation of processes. So we started in 2016-2017. Estonia started in uh, the year 2000. Great Britain started in 2010. So we have uh, about seven years of delay. But this means that we can actually uh, learn from the lessons of other countries. Uh, from uh, September, we will uh, start to uh, test this new app that will enable local administration to interact with the citizens, for instance, uh, pay taxes, local taxes, and so on, with a simple application. I can see, I, don't, I can already perceive a certain skeptic, skepticism on your part, but do believe me, please, this is something that can be done if there is a will, a will to change and uh, there is not a problem in terms of funds, of money. There is a problem in terms of lack of, uh, uh, of technological know-how, of legal knowledge, of management of uh, difficult and complex processes. So to conclude, uh, some time ago, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the newspaper La Stampa. So um, they asked me to imagine Italy from the point of view of public administration and write a, a short article. And I said, and I wrote, digital democracy to simplify everyday life because the government has to simplify the citizen's life, the life of uh, enterprises. I dream of a country where politicians try to understand the technological transformation instead of um, fearing it. And I would like for these politicians to be the rule rather than the exception, where they actually promote the right to innovation, where technological competence is are embedded in public uh, enterprises uh, where there are uh, um, enterprises led by young people rather than uh, older people and uh, where working for public administration is an honor and uh, where uh, there are uh, public research centers that are centers of excellence that can really be the engine of uh, the progress of the country. So there is this will to dream, to dream big. And at the same time, uh, this dream leads to concrete steps that will take us to the uh, simplif simplification of public administration through the simplification of processes, making life simpler for citizens. So this is my mom at the end. She finally understood. It took me about one, hour, one year and a half to explain to her what I was doing. So if you're interested in uh, following our work, this is how you can do it. Thank you. Right, so after these two exciting presentations and well, it would have been very much appreciated. So we have uh, some questions that we have gathered beforehand. So. Mr. Tafura, so please uh, try to be as short as possible. 
please be short. Good evening. As we all know, the technological revolution is occurring and is very fast. To say artificial intelligence will bring about a, a real labor revolution. Last February, the Foundation for Subsidiarity carried out a conference at Bicocca to sort of talk about the need to regulate artificial intelligence from the start in order to avoid any possible uh, employment-related issues. What's your opinion? What's your take on that? Do you think that artificial intelligence may really replace uh, human beings, or it's just a matter of integrating the two things? Mr. Luca Galli? Pope Francis, on August 11th, at the Circo Massimo in Rome for the Synod for Young People, underscored the need to keep dreaming, especially for young generations. He said a young guy that is not able to dream is uh, somehow a person that won't be able to understand the force and strength of life because dreams keep you alive somehow and uh, sort of push you. So according to an OCDE report in 2017, uh, many Italians went abroad between uh, 125,000 and 300,000. And according to some estimates, one quarter of young people of the next 10 years will move abroad. So it seems that uh, the Italian dream has stopped to be interesting. So do politicians think about this? And uh, is it better to be happy with little in Italy or dream about going abroad? So. These uh, sorts of uh, escape from Italy is necessary something negative or not? President Violante, in your book, The Need to Have Duties, you stated that young generations are used to rise but not to duties. What do you mean by duties? Which are the duties that, in your opinion, a young Italian from today should comply with. Now it's time for Lorenzo Rosel. The digital and intangible development seem to raise a double challenge. On the one hand, you have to take advantage of the benefits. On the other hand, we feel the need to protect from the risks. So there was a time when institutions had to protect us from the conflict between labor and capital. Today, the conflict seems to be between those who are inside the establishment and those that are out of the establishment, so are excluded from the system, so they cannot sort of enjoy the mechanisms that were devised in the past. So that said, which could be the best possible future of our political institutions also in order to better tackle these challenges? The last question is going to be asked by Mr. Marco. Let's see. To me, being an Italian has to do with the politics <laughs> and a passion for reality and the res publica. But actually, I today, politics seem to be sort of uh, detached from reality. And uh, well, if we consider the tragedy of Genoa, well, the government uh, seemed to have all truth. And uh, after the Dignita decree, well, people say that uh, Italians still look for a permanent job and are not flexible at all. Well, so my question is very easily, which is the role of politics today? And uh, what can really uh, make men happy? And are really the uh, forces that uh, move history or not? So, well, I should uh, be 
equipped with artificial intelligence to remember all these very dense questions. So I have them in front of me. As to the first question, the impact of artificial intelligence, well, first of all, we need to define artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? It's a self-learning software. The more the software has data, the better it gets. This is what artificial intelligence is about. And then we have general artificial intelligence. This is something that is far, far away from us. And specific artificial intelligence for specific uh, uh, applications. So these are two separate and different things. So let's talk about artificial intelligence applied to specific problems and issues. I'm uh, very optimistic about artificial intelligence, I might say it. And I think that some problems that uh, seem to be impossible to be solved, like the problem of plastics or pollution or medical issues, well, all these things will be solved and fixed in 20 years from now. So again, these are positive answers because those solutions will be possible thanks to artificial intelligence. So, well, I know that they may sound uh, a bit uh, daring, but uh, I think we do not need to regulate uh, artificial intelligence to avoid uh, a sort of labor reduction. First of all, that would be extremely risky because you may try to fix a problem and then create another one. Instead, I would talk about uh, regulation of the use of artificial intelligence. This is something else, because the scariest thing are sort of, uh, sort of weapons that can function by themselves with uh, no man's intervention. This is scary. When it comes to medical solutions, well, any solution would be more than welcome when it comes to the use and application of uh, different intelligence. Then you have ethical issues. So ethical choices made by an algorithm. This is something else. This is another story. And so then you need to consider that, but then you need to consider single activities and maybe regulate them. And also regulations need to be dynamic, especially when it comes to AI. What may seem to be right and meaningful and reasonable today it may not be in 20 years the time from now. So I would avoid to talk about general AI regulation, but instead, I think we should tackle specific uh, issues generated by specific applications of AI. Well, just a remark on AI in general. Any big innovation brought about change. This is inevitable. Well, and I'm referring to labor change, uh, strategic vision changes, cultural changes. And so any big innovation has always brought about that. And opposing big innovation is always something negative that doesn't lead you anywhere. So to me, the basic issue is, first of all, to uh, understand what is at stake. And then sort of uh, we should also try to avoid too many regulations, otherwise we risk to regress instead to progress. We need to see things uh, on a sort of uh, little by little basis, see how to cope with it. And uh, Diego talked about weapons, uh, but some time ago I talked uh, with a high-ranking uh, U.S. officer on this topic. and. Uh, well, this person said that maybe in a few years' time uh, we could use robots in a conflict. But if a robot is sort of uh, neutralized, it costs one million dollars, and uh, if a man is killed, I just have to pay for a sort of uh, monetary compensation to the widow. It may sound cynical, but this is uh, an argument. So when we think about this, we need to consider all of these things. So do not get me wrong, but I mean, that may come into play with no ideology behind, of course. And then, so the Pope, the dream, dreams, uh, um, keeping you alive, uh, 
I should uh, believe it, but uh, I mean, I'm not a Catholic. And I think that uh, Catholics are a big promoter of hope, and hope is very important. Hope results from commitment, from work, from trust, from confidence. So uh, when it comes to the fact of going abroad, the brain, the, the brain drain and all that, but this is not a key issue. The very big issue is the following. Where can I somehow fulfill my potential at best? It's not a matter of the Italian that is going abroad, but I mean, how many non-Italians want to come to Italy? Our country, in spite of everything, remains very attractive. Well, one of my sons works in the US, and today going abroad it's not uh, a tragedy, it's not a disaster, but then you can always come back if you want. But our country needs to be appealing and attractive enough. We need to make our country more attractive. And uh, we lag behind in that respect. I said that we need to recreate uh, I mean, the enchantment for Italy and also to complete the Italy creation process as a state. This is a big issue and then also fully commit. We cannot expect solutions uh, sort of coming out from the blue. And then Alessia asked a question about duties. May we show please a slide on duties? Here we have a couple of sentences, one by Mazzini, Giuseppe Mazzini, four sentences, one by Aldo Moro, and uh, we have uh, Mr. Sergio Marchione. Well, there seems to be a passive attitude that is uh, deteriorating our way of being together and looking at the future, as if we thought we have the right to a better future without uh, knowing that you need to conquer that. I'm not a history teacher or a professor, but uh, I try to think about the origin of all this, and my answer is that, ironically, somehow, big conquest can also lead uh, to unexpected results, so like in 68, uh, a revolutionary movement uh, that let us progress enormously when it comes to social uh, rights, uh, but unfortunately it had a devastating effect uh, uh, when it comes to the relationship to the duty. We live in the time of right, uh, right to salary, right to a permanent job, the right to uh, cry, the right to want this and this and this. So right, of course, are important and have to be expected. Right? We cannot just live by rights because this kind of uh, evolution of the species create a species that uh, won't dare to fight. I mean, uh, risks to create a generation, risks to be entrapped uh, in a sort of cage. We need to go back to the sense of duty and awareness that to get something, you also need to give something away. We need to rediscover the value of duty and uh, the contribution everybody can make uh, to building our present and most of all our future. Well, this is a sentence by a quote by Simon Weil. It's about four easy duties, so and always the relation between duty and right. So I just put together these ideas by Mazzini through Aldo Moro, Sergio Marchione, and Simon Weil, because I think that um, we should understand the important balance between rights and duties. We have duties of solidarity, political, constitutional, civic. And then we have duties uh, towards ourselves. And we have uh, duties vis-a-vis -vis the others. So having duties vis-a-vis -vis ourselves needs to be rigorous and set goals, try to achieve them, say be rigorous and uh, considerate. When you are sort of rigorous and set goal and comply with that, you succeed. And when you have a sense of duty, you understand that 
the sense of duty creates a sense of community. And so it, it is very important to have also a sense of duty because in a society with rights that acknowledges the sense of duty, you can grow, you can progress, you can empower people. And this is what we should promote, the right balance between rights and duties vis-a-vis -vis ourselves first and foremost and vis-a-vis -vis the others. And then Lorenzo talked about conflicts and again, I would like to know what Diego thinks about this. I think that today we have a, a big, big conflict between those that can get their living out of the work of other people and those who have to work. I think that this is the biggest conflict ever today. So we should somehow marginalize the people that uh, live on the expenses of uh, other people's work. And then the last question, well, is democracy sort of uh, deteriorating? I mean, is politics deteriorating democracy or I mean, what's the relationship? But democracy is something that uh, is not natural. I mean, it relies on the intelligence of people and uh, the willingness to be free. It needs to be, so to be somehow taken good care of. And this is a duty that uh, is not just of politicians, but of citizens in general. I mean, this is everybody's duty. This is everybody's work. This is everybody's task to take good care of uh, democracy. I think that today's politics should have one top priority, to make this country work. And if we consider the tragedy of Genoa, I was struck by two things mostly. Well, of course, we need to understand who are the people who are to blame for that. But also, I was struck by, I mean, uh, the uh, sort of, uh, silence and calm of the people, mourning, so being sober, being sort of non-aggressive, being open to other cultures. Did that struck me positively. So, I mean, I think that politics should try to d draw on that. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Pichin, do you need to finish this uh, answering? To, grande. to give us also an answer to the future of this great plan in order to be Italians uh, without going back uh, about 3,000 years. In order to close uh, the uh, answer on uh, artificial intelligence, there will be n nothing more important then agreeing on the rules to manage uh, artificial intelligence. These are, these are decisions that will have to be taken, not even at European level, at uh, G20 level, at UN level, or any other uh, new international organization that might be created. So this obviously dilutes the uh, uh, national identity, because when you talk about uh, technological innovation, the world becomes smaller. And uh, then there is another aspect with reference to the attractiveness. So we do not have to worry about those Italians that decided to leave the country, but we have to worry about how to attract non-Italians to Italy. So we are talking obviously about uh, uh, employment at certain levels. So we're going beyond the concept of nation, uh, but uh, we are uh, talking about the concept of great metro big metropolitan areas that need to be attractive to attract labor forces. So uh, metropolitan areas, uh, in, uh, Milan, Turin, that will have to be competitive with reference to London, Berlin, Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco. So we will have to move towards uh, something that uh, 
is not Italy, but is rather an, a metropolitan area that can attract talents. So, well, the hope is that urban areas will be able to lead this process of technological transformation to become a, a tool of change because uh, we have to expect more from uh, urban areas than from our central state. So progress will come from those who are uh, who have everyday contact with the citizens. So the infrastructures will have to work. For instance, uh, um, um, waste collection, waste recycling, public transports, these are the things that are important for citizens, and this is where uh, technological revolution will bring the um, biggest uh, changes. From my point of view, it is also important to be, to be a model for others. I hope that my small contribution will then be amplified. There will be other people following my example, and I hope that this model will really be of great help to our country. And if someone had asked me, do you want to come and work in the Italian public administration for the rest of your life, I would have said, no way. But the idea that I have a project that has a certain deadline, which can then be carried on by other people, well, this is a model that can be actually uh, uh, used also by others. We don't, I personally do not want to bring this project to conclusion, but I just want uh, to, uh, to, to carry on with uh, this model. I will uh, um, conclude this cooperation on uh, uh, November the 15th, but I hope there will other people who will carry on what, I, what we did. This yes. is what every good manager should do. The, the, uh, this is something that actually goes against the political trend because when a politician has his own position, they will never leave it. So we wanted to uh, create a model that is not based on me as a person, but on the project as a whole. And this is, this is in part the sense uh, of our common, common purpose. So, so as I said, I had contact with so many different cultures, uh, India, China, and I must admit that Italy is, maybe India as well, is the country where uh, the sense of common good is the lowest. Uh, the idea of doing something for uh, the well-being of everybody, from the formal as well as from the substantial point of view. So we have to be an example in this sense. What really makes me worry is that I found out that important people do not give a good example. I participate in meetings where there are ministers, important politicians, and people smoke, smoke at uh, these uh, meetings. And this is, this is something that is not done. There is a law against this. So if we do not reala realize that we have a certain responsibility, there are people looking at us. If there is uh, someone, the people working in the building, for instance, uh, that see politicians working during the, uh, smoking during their uh, meetings, uh, what would they do? They go to the bathroom and they smoke themselves. So these are small things, but they are vital. And so we have to set an example. And we cannot get used to the fact, well, everybody does it, so we can go on like this. But this is something that we have to change inside ourselves. So the contribution of the individual, and then there is another aspect, that of, of training and education. In many countries and in Italy, we need to start as soon as possible, but we cannot expect the, the state, the government, to do this on its own. 
there have to be really dramatic changes over time in terms of uh, um, what is taught to students. So this doesn't mean that we have to reform our school system because that would take five years and then in the end the reform will probably fail. It means that we need to continuously include new ways of teaching. We start. We have to start a teaching, for instance, programming in, in primary school. There, is, there are tools that make it very easy for children to do so. So uh, we need to... Uh, uh, for instance, uh, teach uh, information science uh, to those who, uh, for, for students at uh, the law faculty, but we have to need to teach philosophy to the students of uh, the information science faculty. So we have to be less specialistic, less focused on a single discipline. So this is something that is very slowly moving. So we really need a contribution on the part of the Italian companies. Uh, the great uh, uh, companies like Google, like Amazon, will have to contribute to the evolution of our society. And it is through training and education that they can give this contribution. This is something that is unavoidable. It has to take place. And then... Uh, we were talking about uh, the problem of conflicts. From my point of view, there needs to be uh, this change, this this uh, this uh, development, which is unavoidable, even though it takes time, in managing the situation without being stopped by historical conflicts and problems. We have to look at the future. And it, at, in this moment, when you have a, a job which is, a, which is a, uh, a, job, a job which is safe, you have your own uh, daily routine, routine, and you don't care what will happen to other people. But now we're living in a moment where uh, changes are taking place. And uh, through the civil society, through education, and so on, this change could become a positive change, a, a, a smooth and quick change. But as I said, education is fundamental. Uh, school, the school system, we leave our children from uh, the age of six to the age of 23 in the hands of a system which is really old at the moment. So this is really worrying and goes beyond the problem of conflicts. There's no answer, I think, to this kind of, uh, of question. Otherwise, it would be easier. Many of the answers we gave tonight could contribute to uh, answer this question. But I really have this, uh, this um, fixed thought. Everything has to start with education, training, primary school, middle school, secondary school. So this is an, uh, also a, a political responsibility because this kind of change has to be managed by uh, political decision makers. And there has to be also the, the, the involvement of people that are, have the necessary skills. And here again, we have another problem, because our political class does not have the skills necessary to manage this change. So we hope that the model we are creating, a uh, model of people that uh, who worked for 20, 30 years, so there is a double cycle, so there are people at the beginning of their career, they have just uh, uh, reached or uh, obtained their PhD. I devote two years of my life to help public administrations at central or local level. Once there was uh, the, the um, compulsory military service. Now we should have a compulsory service to help public administrations. That could be an idea. This is the kind of brainstorming we have to, to uh, carry on. We, and then there is the second part at the end of one's career. 
55, uh, 58 years of age, at the end of my working life, I dedicate two or three years to help my country, my, my local administration. Otherwise, we will always have the same political class, maybe a bit younger than the previous one. But from the point of view of the approach, there are not so many differences. Allora, qual è right. So, after this first round uh, on the topic of being Italian, certainly there's a matter of legacy, of tradition, of Catholicism, but actually we also heard different things. We need to be all that, but also open and positive, as uh, Devika wrote on the Corriere della Sera newspaper, being positive, having this sort of positive anthropology, trying to sort of uh, be projected towards the future. And without that, there is no future. This is the real digital technological revolution. You can't be Italian today. Uh, I mean, just with pizza and mandolina, you need to turn this country into a modern place. A place always ahead of time, so that's the real issue. But, well, we will continue our discussion during the next round, as Diego Pacentini suggested, how can we sort of lay the foundations of this common good? So Simoncini and Violante will talk about that and say, stay tuned, we'll keep talking about that. Thank you, good evening.